Okay, so I think we will get started because uh, nobody else has joined us in the last minute. So I think this might be our group. This is great. Welcome everybody. Hope you're all doing well, enjoying the summit so far. Uh, so my name is Katie Nolan and um, I work for the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs in Kempville. And Anne had asked me to just uh, moderate this session today, which I'm very happy to do. Um, I wonder if we can just do a very quick, um, if everybody could just say their name and where they're from, what your connection is to the agriculture and food sector, that might give us a good sense of who's in our chat room today. Uh, we'll start with you, George. Oh. <laughs> I'm George Harden. I'm a retired dairy farmer. I've been in the industry for quite a few years. My connection with this at this point is I'm co-chair of the Workforce Eastern Workforce Innovation Board. Awesome. Okay, great. Thanks, George. Uh, we'll go to Varley next. Hello, I'm Varley Taylor. I'm Supervisor Employment Services with Keys Job Centre in Gananoque. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Eleanor, you want to go ahead? I'm Eleanor Renault. I'm a councillor in Elizabethtown, Kitley, and I'm also a farmer in, uh, in Kitley Township. Great to see you, Eleanor. Oh, good to see Thanks you, for dear. Being here. <laughs> uh, who else have we got? Michelle. Hi, I'm Michelle Andrews. I uh, have a small 10-acre farm in Elizabethtown, Kitley, um, and I'm uh, also uh, working at the Maitland Tower site and project. And we are launching a new um, community development, a community initiative where we're hoping to um, support locals and secure food in the region. Good to put a, a face to a name there, Michelle. Thanks for being here today. Uh, Claire. Thanks, Katie. Uh, nice to see you. I don't know if I know anybody else on here. Um, I am Claire Smith. I'm one of the councillors representing South Crosby Ward in the township of Rideau Lakes. And I'm currently sitting as the Economic Development Committee Chair for Rideau Lakes. And I also co-own and operate Bush Garden Farm uh, and Bush Garden Farmstead Cheese uh, with my husband and my in-laws uh, near Elgin. Great to have you here, Claire. Thanks a lot. John. You're muted, John. Okay, maybe John will have you on standby while you're getting yourself off mute and we'll go over to Laurel. Katie, you can unmute them yourself, eh? I think. Okay, Laurel, are you with us? Can you hear me? Yes, there we are. Okay, Okay. sorry. So I'm um, Laurel Burnham Green. I am the chairperson for the Community uh, Development Committee for Friend of Young. And I live on a small farm. I've always been interested in the, the food and agricultural um, movement. And I, I'm interested in farmers markets and what's available for that as um, an opportunity for people and uh, here, I grow saffron. Oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Uh, I'd love to hear more about that sometime. Um, John, go ahead. Uh, you appear to be unmuted, John, but we still can't hear you. You're having some audio troubles. Okay, we'll go over to Ray Morrison. Go ahead, Ray. I think he put his intro in the chat. Oh, my apologies. Um, right, Augusta Township. Um, yes, so oh, thank you, Ray, my apologies. So um, Ray Morrison, the CAO of Augusta Township is with us um, along with the mayor, deputy mayor and um, active planning officer. Welcome to you all, glad to have you here. Um, so I cannot unmute you. Um, you need to, to do that. 
Um, but I think we also have um, with us in our uh, discussion, Andrew from Baldwin AV and he can help us. And I think Andrew, you're able to um, ask people to unmute um, if they want to, right? I was trying to do that earlier, but I don't know if it was working. Anyway, we will, we will figure this out as we go along. Um, wonderful to have you all here. Let's get into our first question, uh, which is a biggie. Um, our first question is uh, really generally, and this <clears throat> kind of uh, harkens back to um, some of the information that was gathered from the recently completed um, widespread BRE study, business retention expansion study in Leeds and Grenville. But the question is, what are the top areas of concern in this sector and how do you think they should be addressed? And in order to uh, answer this question, I think I'm just gonna um, ask you folks to raise your hand if you have something that you wanna say in relation to the question. And um, we'll do that at, rather than doing a full roundtable. Um, so um, my apologies, I've lost my, uh, there we go, sorry. Um, so uh, who would like to start with this? What are the top areas of concern in the sector, the agri-food sector, and what should be done to address them? I don't, I don't know how to raise my hand on Zoom, but I'm putting it up if you can see. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Claire. Sure, well, I just thought, oh, I can say for the farm and the cheese, as well as uh, sort of what I hear from residents more generally who have businesses in Rideau Lakes. Uh, I know for, for us making cheese on the farm, uh, the biggest challenge of that, aside from learning to make cheese that was any good, uh, was marketing because you don't have to market your own product usually uh, in dairy farming. It's, uh, you know, you have quota and so you can, you just have a, a right to produce a certain amount and you know it's sold and you're getting paid for it. But with the direct sales now of our, our cheese, uh, we lost initially all of our restaurant customers because the restaurants all were closed. So I would say now eight months into the pandemic, um, we probably had in the end a sort of a regular year for sales for for revenues. Um, it just was a lot of work uh, and pretty stressful because there were no restaurants. So we had to try and direct market to people who were actually like buying bigger volumes for their families or sort of in buying clubs for their neighborhoods, uh, like Wolf Island, for instance, and um, sort of more remote communities that were trying not to go out shopping. And then um, the farmers markets as well. And the boards for those were so impressive. Um, the Memorial Center market in Kingston, we normally would have run a booth at every week, all summer and, and sometimes all year, uh, maybe not every week. And they took one week off and then relaunched virtually and have been going every week since then. And the Gananoque market, the farmer's market, also relaunched virtually when the season would normally have opened in Gananoque and ran out of the Gananoque theater, which wasn't being used. So, so they were really nice success stories to be able to market more through retailers and still through farmer's markets, uh, but without that restaurant piece, or at least very much of it. Um, and the work behind the scenes to make sure that we still had cheese going out of the aging room. Um, more generally, I think in Rideau Lakes, uh, if I'm not going on too long, we are about 20 minutes away from the American border. So I would say in the summer, probably half of our seasonal residents would normally come from the States. So all of those tourism businesses and resorts and rentals and restaurants Again, had to find new markets. It definitely was not as busy in Rito Lakes as it usually is in the summer. A lot of places chose not to open for rentals for accommodations to tourists. And the, you know, the camper parks and that, they had, a, they had, I think, bookings once they were allowed to have bookings again. But again, a lot less in and out, more just people brought their stuff, stayed for the weekend, and then took their stuff out again. 
So I think the tourism businesses, it's been hard on because um, they lost access to a lot of their regular market. And then just with the restrictions, it was hard to, to run. So this winter we'll be telling who had the reserves or who had the outside income they were bringing in for like these small businesses, you know, where one spouse will work out somewhere else, whether they had got enough to make it through the winter. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, really interesting there. So marketing, obviously totally different market channels now for some businesses. Um, other thoughts? I'm wondering, um, Eleanor, would you want to, you you um, have a different uh, type of business model uh, than Claire does. Would you want to make a comment about uh, your perspective on um, the top areas of concern in the agriculture sector? Well, Thank you. And one area of concern is, and found it really difficult this year, I had many more people wanting beef and I could have supplied it, but I couldn't get it killed. There, there just is no capacity. Uh, I had to go as far away as Winchester at one point to get a slaughterhouse. And I've had to do that again for next year. Uh, I'm getting some done in Athens, but there just isn't the capacity here. And we've got a young lad in Lansdowne area that would like to open up. But again, very difficult to get started. And a lot, we've lost a lot of those slaughterhouses just due to the fact that every inspector interprets the rules and the legislation differently. So if you get different inspectors coming in, you just give up because one says one thing, the next one says something different. And we lost a lot of our slaughterhouses. So that is something that if this trend continues about people wanting to buy local, wanting to support Ontario, which the province is really pushing, uh, we need more local capacity for that. Uh, we've been doing a lot of, my son-in-law is a chef, of course not working this summer. He really ramped up his growing of vegetables and things and has done value added to a lot of it. But how, how do you manage to expand that? And what if he never, what if the restaurant business never really comes back as well as it was? Uh, this could be a line for him or for anyone for that matter, if the local stays on track, if everybody stays launching to buy Ontario produce uh, how, how do you expand? How do you get the, the capital to start up that expansion? It's one thing to be small and just doing a few little things here and there, but if you really want to expand enough to raise your family on it, how, how do you do that? So Eleanor, just to um, pick up on your point about um, slaughter capacity, is it is it more... Um, more facilities? Is it more staff at existing facilities? Is it, um, you know, more shifts? Like what, what do you see as um, sort of the most important bottleneck there when it comes to meat processing? There's the kill capacity is, is missing. Okay. Uh, you could go to the plant in Kingston at the pen, which kills, but then you have to find some place to cut it. So you'd have to actually physically take it from there to somewhere else to cut. Uh, doable, but where are you gonna find some place to cut? Uh, I know Athens can't find staff, so they, they could probably run two shifts. They could probably have two kill days. Uh, when I asked to be on the waiting list, she said, she kind of chuckled and said, yeah, you'd be number 400. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure if her list is that extensive, but it's still high enough that I'll never get in on a cancellation idea. So yeah, there is, there's the kill capacity, but if you had someone that could say Athens could run two days a week on kill and someone else could open up a butcher shop that would just take that and butcher it because they don't have the staff to butcher any more than what they, they have. That's a lot of work and you need a lot of people for that and they don't have it and they don't know where to get it. It's just not out there. Great, thanks, Eleanor. Uh, Allison, you've got your hand up. Um, go ahead, Allison. Yeah, um, so some of the other challenges that I heard was um, just surrounding the different 
uncertainties that were around. So there was a lot of, you know, we bring in foreign workers to help us. Will they be allowed? What's the protocol? Um, like Claire mentioned, you know, our market's going to proceed or not, um, which isn't anyone's fault because like and we were saying, things were changing by the hour, if not by the minute, when everything was first starting up. Um, one thing that I do notice based on the different announcements that come from the province and uh, the federal gov government is there seems to be a lot of focus on brick and mortar type businesses. And there hasn't really been a conversation on the agricultural sector that much or about the independent agriculture endeavors or home-based businesses. It does it definitely seems like it's the incorporated businesses that are being addressed um, during those announcements. So I know you especially know what OMAFRA um, can be offering, but it just isn't really out in the public eye. Okay, great. Thanks, Allison. Um, I'm sorry we're so short of time, but I, I do want to move on to our next question, um, which is which I'm going to put in the uh, chat. Um, and I think it it really does tie into our ongoing discussion here. So please feel free to add any um, comments that you have sort of simmering. Uh, the question is, what type of buy local initiatives and value added products should be considered? So th those are obviously two different things, a buy local initiative and value added products. Um, but um, if anyone has um, comments on either of those, um, feel free to unmute yourself or um, put up your hand in the chat and, um, and we can address that. My apologies. I put the, uh, <laughs> I sent the question in the chat just to Andrew, but now it's there for everybody to take a look at. Um, George, do you want to tackle this one? You're a producer of uh, a value-added product and that you market locally. How do you see this? Buy maple syrup. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I think no. I think I think vertical integration is a great way to go. Um, I think if we're going to be surviving into the future, especially small businesses, you're going to have to have value-added. Um, I, I was, as a maple syrup producer, I was out visiting a fellow who's doing all um, uh, barrels and just selling barrels. And I worked out what he was pr making per year and you couldn't live on it. If, if you can't get into stores, if you can't get into um, other institutions, you're, you're not going to make money. Going, I, I wanted to address, was it Allison that spoke about the offshore workers? Mm -hmm. Yes, and I, I, and I think, and I know I'm sort of going back to that question, but I think that's so important to have labor. That's one of the one of the things that's really hurting out of the industry right now. Not just offshore workers, but then we need to be training more workers to go into the agricultural business because there just aren't enough workers out there. The other, and and I know I keep be going back, but the other point is that we need really need to be looking at international trade because the dairy farmers got whacked so badly after the last three. Um, uh, trade negotiations, we need to be thinking about that. And that's international trade is so important, especially with the US. So that's me. All right, great. Thanks for that, George. Um, Darren, I noticed you've got uh, an idea in the chat. Um, if you want to go ahead and unmute and speak to that, I'll just read it out for folks. Uh, get stakeholders together to form a committee whose goal is to create a United County's Elites Grenville food production strategy to market and support our local food um, producers. Um, do you want to do you want to speak to what that might look like, or sort of why you see a need for that, Darren? Uh, sure, why not? Um, so I know, and you could probably help me with this, Katie. So SDG also did something similar to this, what, three years ago? Um, yeah, they've had definitely some ongoing initiatives like this. Yeah. Um, not so much driven by the county's government, um, mm -hmm. but definitely located there, yeah. Yeah, so I, I just think that uh, a lot of our producers, um, as, as we've sort of heard time and time again, and I know you're quite familiar with this, is that uh, sort of the 
inability to um, do the things they need to do because they just don't have the funds, they don't have the time, just sort of a, a general shortage of lack of resources where I think if we had a more, a more collaborative approach, if we, uh, if we could sort of get all the stakeholders to the table and say, okay, what, what do we need here? Let's do an inventory of what we have. So let's figure out what we need and create a strategy with how to get that here. Um, I, I firmly believe that, you know, every, every producer out there is trying their absolute best, but they have limitations. And I think if we were able to combine some resources, um, I really think we could come up with, with a plan on how to address some of the issues that we seem to be running into time and time again. And I think the United counties, uh, can facilitate that. Um, at least as in, in terms of creating that initial opportunity to collaborate. Okay, great. Thanks, Darren. Um, there's a few uh, items in the chat coming up. Um, Michelle, um, the question about Food Corps leads Grenville Lanark. Um, it is the, the group is still um, active. Um, and for those who don't know, Food Corps leads Grenville Lanark is an organization. Uh, it's it's really not an organization. It's a a network um, of different organizations throughout the Tri Counties area that's hosted by the health unit um, and some of their dietitians and health promoters there. And some years ago, they created a food charter for the region, which is sort of a statement of um, principles around um, the food sector and and what kind of vision. <clears throat> um, they developed for the sector. And um, since then, they've developed a number of toolkits on how to help those principles come to life in our communities, one for municipalities, one for consumers, and one for schools. Um, and, you know, done some events and things like that. It is still active, but um, this year especially, uh, not meeting very frequently, but um, they are very, um, still very interested in, in other um, people to come forward to, to participate. Um, Claire, you're, um, you're mentioning uh, some more issues around, uh, around workforce, which are very important. And I think we were, we went into this pandemic with already in a, a workforce shortage and, and uh, some of that is, is really under a lot of pressure right now. Another question about food banks, um, trying to source local food for food banks. Um, I don't know if anyone has a comment on that, um, but uh, Michelle, do you wanna unmute and speak to your question around that? Yeah, I, I've just been volunteering since the pandemic started with the Merrickville Emergency Food Cupboard. And I've also been in contact with um, Prescott, and it's just my experience that they're not, they're sourcing from wholesalers to make, because they're understaffed and they just do what's easy, but they're not as a result getting local food. And it seems that's a missed opportunity to have local producers feed folks. And, you know, the, the food banks are paying for this food. So how could we um, just keep it more local? Um, but they're not, they're not, they don't have a staff, you know, in Merrickville, there's 0.2 of a headcount doing this or something. So she can't manage figuring out, talking to 10 different farms. So we're trying to do something with local farmers just in that little initiative, but that's just one example. Yeah, and that's a great point. There are a lot of challenges with that. Um, I know that the table in Perth, which is a community food center, um, also runs a food bank program and, and they have developed some programming uh, to help them provide more local. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it is an ongoing uh, challenge that I think everyone is, is quite interested in finding some solutions. Um, any other comments about uh, buy local initiatives or value added products? Uh, we, I just want to take the last one minute of the session to have Andrew show us a video. But um, if anybody wants to use the last couple minutes to provide a comment, please, uh, please go ahead. John, I see that you've uh, got a comment. If you want to unmute and uh, speak to it, please uh, feel free. Yes, uh, thanks, Katie. I, I finally was able to navigate, uh, which you would think I would know how to do it after all those months. But yeah, um, 
it really takes political will. And I think while Darren is right, uh, the first thing to do is to bring the stakeholders to the table. Try and exercise some uh, pressure on your local politicians to seize the moment because COVID has certainly underlined uh, the desire and demand for local food. Um, and uh, I, I think pressuring the politicians at this point in time to devote some resources or to, to uh, uh, bring the stakeholders together under their auspices, I think it's absolutely important. Um, it's, it's a perfect time to, we've been talking about the local food production and distribution for a long time. And uh, it's, it's time that we can actually act because I think there is a real desire and a real interest in local food. So the timing is right. And uh, for all the participants around the table, um, you know, by email, get on the phone, uh, see what you can do to, to pressure your local politicians to, to get on the ball and do something. That's my comment. Thanks. All right. Well, I guess you can expect your phone to be ringing then, <laughs> Councillor Barkley. <laughs> um, Andrew, do you, thank you all. This is great. I wish we had more time. Hi, folks. I see Kim and I see Wendy. Um, can you hear me, ladies? I sure can. Yes. Hi. <laughs> Great to see you. Aww. Um, and Wendy, oh, hey, Wendy, how's it going? Very Did good, you know thanks. Wendy it was. And Tanya's here too. Excellent. Hi, Tanya. Um, I, I'm going to assume you ladies don't all know each other. So we're going to get started. If you can each just say who you are and what your connection is to this topic, um, that would be wonderful. Um, Kim, do you want to go ahead? Sure thing. So I'm Kim Goodman. I am currently the Director of Community and Business Services at the Township of Leeds in the Thousand Islands. I have sitting here in the room with me today, one of our councillors and our CAO. Um, our Economic Development Committee put forward to Council, which was just approved last month, is a new um, economic development strategy. And of course, it has three pillars and agribusiness is one of them. So from that perspective, we're um, a very agricultural rich community um, with food producers. We've got a lot of great projects lined up, but uh, we really wanna see how we can continue to support this sector of our, um, of our business community. So we're really keen to, to learn more about programs, networking opportunities and other support mechanisms and so on and so forth. Oh, that's really exciting. Congratulations on that. Um, Wendy, go ahead. Okay. Oh, I'm, 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 can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm Wendy Onstein. I'm the manager at the Leeds Gravel Small Business Center. And I just, I'm kind of went, I'm kind of in the group by default. There wasn't anything else that appealed to me. And I think that we have a real opportunity in Leeds Gravel um, for a food, agriculture, economy. Yeah. So I'm hanging out for I'm hanging out with you guys. Great, glad to have you here, Wendy. Thanks a lot. Your uh, is, your sound is a little bit choppy, so I don't know where your mic is located. But if you come on again, maybe just try to talk right into it. Um, Tanya, do you want to go ahead? Hi, ladies. It's Tanya Hammond here. Um, I'm a local writer, so I'm actually covering this event for our local paper. And um, as most of you know, I also work closely with my sister, Wendy. So I always have an ear to what's going on so that I can help her out in any way I can. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks for being here, Tanya. And say hi to Wendy for us. Um, okay, so our Will questions you? are, uh, first of all, a pretty broad question, which I'm going to attempt to put in the chat. Hang on a sec. Um, uh, okay, that's the second one. Hold on. Um, so the first question is around what are the top areas of concern and how should they be addressed? And I wonder if... Um, Kim, if you wanna, if you've just developed a strategic plan that identifies agriculture and agri-food, um, does that plan include some um, some comments on on this topic? Um, I believe so. Like I said, in fairness, we're in very early days. What we kind of want to do is is probably chat with different sectors within the agribusiness over the coming weeks and months 
Um, so different kinds of food producers, um, people who are taking that maybe, people like Wendy, I mean, she's in our backyard as well, right? Um, and trying to figure out what the challenges and opportunities are for them within our community, and then how that aligns with what's happening at the county region. Of course, we're members of the um, St. Lawrence Corridor as well. Um, and how all of these pieces sort of fit together. And then how do we position ourselves as a municipality to address those challenges and, and pursue those opportunities, right? And so is it a lack of capacity with being able to get their produce to market, for example, in terms of understanding what the legislative requirements are? Are there funding um, opportunities that perhaps we can connect these businesses with or help them draft applications so that they're successful in going after some of the funding so that they can kind of go to the next level, right? And we see those as kind of being some uh, prime opportunities. As well, um, we have successfully, the pardon me the words, Friday afternoon, um, successfully been working under the Digital Main Street program. And we've had a lot of success reaching out to our Main Street businesses. However, obviously, most of our food producers are not along Main Street, but that's not to say they're not doing farm side stands or online sales, some of them or whatever that looks like. So how can we work with them to enhance their online presence? We see that as being another really key component of that. So if there was a digital Main Street like program, but that could be applied to the agricultural sector, we think that that would be of real benefit here in Leeds in the Thousand Islands. Yeah, absolutely. And now more than ever, for sure. Um, Tanya, what's your take on this? Um, your perspective on top areas of concern and what needs to be done? Well, I would have to definitely agree with Kim and Wendy mentioned that in the previous, um, you know, chat that we just had that there, there are a lot of businesses that aren't able to participate in the digital main street because they're simply not main street. Um, so, so that, and, and, you know, with that, there are other regulations, you know, that, that people have to meet. Um, you know, many of these are commercial, but, you know, again, and they certainly have more than enough staff um, to meet those eligibility requirements, but they're not on main street. So, so that's a definite concern. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, earlier this year, there was a, um, a program that launched by OMAFRA that was around um, e-business grants for agriculture and food businesses. Um, and uh, it was very fully subscribed very quickly. Um, so I think it does really show uh, that there, there is a, um, a lot of opportunity there to, to really um, move towards that kind of e-commerce. Um, Wendy, did you want to have, um, did you want to add anything to this comment about top areas of concern in agri-food and how they should be addressed? Me? <laughs> um, not really. Um, Except I really like we are getting a lot of traction on the main the digital main street project, but as Tanya mentioned and I mentioned it in the previous group, I have people that don't qualify for that, and um, it's it's really frustrating. So, yeah. Um, yeah, in a geography like ours, right? I mean, it's yeah, many. I like, <laughs> there's like lots it's, of and 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 apparently it's about zoning too. But you know, when I look at somebody like um, that's on Highway Two that can't access this, Highway Two is a main street that runs from Toronto to Montreal. <laughs> right? It's a main street. Yeah, that's a big. Yeah. It's, sure. it's a yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so um, let's go. Let's go to our next question, which is around buy local initiatives and value-added products. Um, and I really think this is such a, a huge strength that we have in this part of the province. And just wondering what um, you folks might think about how, what, what do we need to do in Leeds Grenville in order to really seize those opportunities around um, buy local food and 
um, you know, that value added economy. Um, do, Tanya, do you want to give us your thoughts on that? I'm just picking on whoever. <laughs> I, know, I know, I right? know. <laughs> um, it, you know, it, it's hard. You're kind of, yes, putting me on the spot. Um, you know, uh, I don't know. Um, the buy local initiatives, you know, I think we also have to, you know, when we're preaching buy local, buy local, we also have to not lose sight of, you know, what we're offering those people, you know, it's, it, it's almost, there, there's a fine line between, you know, it's almost coming off as, you know, begging them to support us. So we stay in business as, you know, but we can't lose sight of the fact of what the benefits they're receiving from us, what our services or products are. Um, so I've been trying to remind people of that because, you know, we do have some businesses that almost come off desperate when they're saying, you know, you're, you know, help me, you know, buy here, buy local because, you know, you're going to keep my business here. But it isn't just that because, you know, as businesses, we're providing so much more to those customers. And I think we have to keep that in the marketing piece too, right? That is so, yeah, that is, I see, Kim, you want to get in on that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I kind of want to piggyback actually on, on what Tanya was saying, right? Um, and I'm going to use this as an example, which maybe seems really peculiar, but the other night, one of the few nights I'm actually glued to the tube and Royale had their commercial on. And I'm sure you've seen it, but it was all about shop Canadian, shop local, right? And I think because we've gone through the pandemic, um, there's a real focus on that shop local, be you know, Canadian nationalism and all of these kinds of things. So I think um, with that in mind, some of the other things is, is how do we play off of other sectors as well, right? So if somebody's coming in, let's say, to do a local food tour and frequent some of our restaurants or farms or whatever, what else can we do to attract and keep them in the region? So, um, but that's got to be a, a bit of a diet you know, a dual role that if people are coming in to, let's say, within our backyard, do a boat tour, a helicopter tour, how are they also championing shop local, buy local um, stores, restaurants, boutiques, whatever that looks like. So I, I think we really need to be looking cross sectorally, perhaps at, at marketing initiatives um, and looking for some really catchy sort of things. Like I said, using the Royale Kleenex or toilet paper commercial as an example, right? How do we I mean, you hate to say it, play off the bleeding hearts a little bit, right? And really bring that to the forefront. I am not a marketing expert, so I can't offer any more than that. Yeah, no, that's that's really critical. So here's a question for all of you then. Like if we, and I, I think this is really important too, um, you know, really making sure that when we market local products, we're marketing them as um, products that can compete in the marketplace and that, um, that offer the consumer a benefit that's beyond that, that doesn't appear as like a, a sort of moral benefit, if you will. Um, what do you ladies think is, are some of the, um, the key, um, features, assets, special, um, what is special about our agri-food sector here? What do you think we have that we can market um, to consumers, be they local or from elsewhere, about um, the, the sector that, um, that we have in Leeds Grenville? You've stumped me, Katie. <laughs> I really want to say maybe it's the diversity. And um, I know here within Leeds in the Thousand Islands, like we have a few farms that are like um, 100 year old farms, right? So they're multi generational. And I think, again, it's something about tying back to family, um, your family roots, for example, the fact that there's some sustainability and su obviously some good succession planning perhaps that's happened within some of these particular businesses. So if there's something that can be done to celebrate that. Um, I also think it's a, it, it's a bit of a pride thing, right? So I know like when you go to the, the larger national chain grocery stores, 
and you see a lot of the products are branded, you know, made in Canada, made in Ontario, but maybe here we need like a, a Leeds Grenville brand, right? Like that sort of buy local that, that maybe flows across the entire region. So um, maybe it's, you know, Leeds Grenville strong or whatever that looks like. I mean, again, um, but that logo with that mark, that local producers, regardless of what it is, whether it's the mustards or an alpaca wool scarf or whatever, but some sort of broader branding. So it becomes like you've got cachet sort of, right? Like it's, it's cool to pick up something from that region, perhaps. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, that is something that I think, um, you know, some years ago, Savor Ottawa was an organization that was trying to create sort of an Eastern Ontario wide brand. Um, and they uh, aren't as active now as they were a few years ago, but um, absent something like that, or, you know, local flavors coming out of Frontenac Arch, um, we really don't have, uh, we really don't have that in the region. And uh, it would be interesting to explore how that might work. Um, Wendy, I see you're unmuted. Do you want to get in there? Well, I, I was just, before Kim had popped in, I was just thinking about the why, like the experience that we have and when we go to our farmer's market, it's, it's, a, it's a feel, it's really hard because it's a feeling, right? And I also think that um, it's a consumer mindset. So you either value buying local, so you see the value in, in buying local in terms of the jobs that it creates and the ripple effect that it has on our local economy. Um, a, a while ago, the DBIA put together something, and I'm sure that they just ripped it off from somewhere, but um, about when you buy something locally, what it actually, when it's all totaled up, what it actually means when you support local. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really, it's, it's about the experience that you have when you purchase something that from a farm. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I always, uh, as you're, you're all talking, I mean, I'm remembering the times that I've been to Wendy's um, country market and those, those products, like the range of products that are in there, which is kind of like a really great cross section of so many of those, um, those value added products that are produced locally and it's, it's meats and it's like some of the best cheeses you'll ever try and it's produce and it's, canned goods and things like that and it's it's really quite um uh impressive uh when you kind of see it all there uh how much how much is is being produced here um and you know it's businesses like that 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 uh really do such a fantastic job of of profiling all of that and making it available um, Tanya, I see you're unmuted too. Did you want to jump in? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to hit another bit of a different angle here. Um, I like to remind people, you know, especially when it comes to food and I, I have a bit of a nutrition background as well that people might not realize. Um, I like to, you know, explain the nutrition difference between buying something local um, that hasn't been transported or, you know, also knowing that the farmer's um, you know, what they're doing, like not using sprays and, and that type of thing. So when you know your farmer and you know how they produce their foods, it's, it's can be more nutritional, you know? Um, so I think that is something we need to remind people that maybe the cost might be a little bit higher than, you know, what you would say at Walmart or something, but the nutritional benefit Polish children. Especially when, uh, when we need to uh, be thinking about health, you know, the better we can improve our immune system now and keep us all healthy, um, the better. So I think a nutrition, you know, conversation has to be in there as well. Okay, this is great. I feel like, you know what we're doing? We're like, this is the first brainstorming session in the Leeds Grenville local food marketing plan. And we've got all these, we've got, we've got nutritional benefits, we've got immunological benefits, we've got um, history of our, our agriculture producers and the farm families here. 
Um, we've got diversity. Like, is this, we're almost done. Like, let's just wrap this up right here. <laughs> I'm just joking. And when you're listening to this later, I am just joking. <laughs> um, go ahead, Kim. Katie, I wanted to add actually, because uh, Tanya kind of alluded to it. So over the last couple of years, we've actually built a really excellent uh, youth program in partnership with Wendy, where we're taking school kids, bringing them out, and that whole giving them the experience about that tactile experience. They go out and they look at the basil and the tomatoes or whatever. And then we do a number of um, in-class sort of things. So then they're making a salad dressing and the pizza sauce and the pizza dough. And then we host a local dinner. And so again, I think there's something about in, from the programming side, because of course that's a little bit more in my wheelhouse and my background, but how do, can we engage, not only bringing tourists to the region to do this, but if we can capture kids through programming opportunities at a young age, be it locally driven municipal programs, 4-H programs, whatever that looks like, right? To, to make it lifestyle right from an early age. So that might be another opportunity. Yeah, that's a, that's a great suggestion. Like it's really, it's not just about the consumer of today. It's about, um, you know, succession and uh, really building like uh, a strong local economy that's gonna last beyond one generation. And, um, you know, I've had some experience with our local 4-H groups as well, and it's just incredible what they can do and how they can expose young people to, um, you know, what, what goes on in agriculture and, uh, you know, in a, increasingly kids that aren't, uh, you know, they don't have that kind of exposure at home uh, and they, they, they don't get it if they don't have those kinds of opportunities. Yeah, great point. Thanks, Kim. Um, so any other, we're going to, in a few minutes, we've just got a closing um, video to, to play, um, but I'm just wondering if any of you have uh, closing thoughts on just even more broadly, um, where you see the, um, the agri-food sector in Leeds-Grenville um, really growing and what some of the opportunities are for right now. This year has been so uh, incredible. And what we've learned. And um, I'm just wondering if there are any takeaways for you about how, how that impacts the ag sector. I know for myself, if you don't mind me kind of jumping in here and what I've seen, it, it's been really amazing to me to watch how when there is a crisis, a really um, serious global, like in some ways life and death crisis, a consumer response goes straight to their local producer and are we ready for that and um how do we um you know ensure that our you know number one my big question is how long will this will this last um you know the incredible demand that we're seeing and then also how can we continue to support this sector so that it's ready for that kind of surge um and and can respond effectively um so that's what i've noticed any any other thoughts about um some of our local strengths and opportunities. Kim, are you, um, do, you want, <laughs> do you want to let us in on what you guys are talking about? Actually, so we're having a whole conversation about like how we clump things together, right? So it would be, you know, let's not just sell the lettuce, but let's sell the lettuce and the celery and the tomatoes and everything together. And I think Wendy does this, I mean, Poor Wendy, I mean, we're just picking on her like crazy. Don't tell her, Tanya. Um, but I mean, she markets some really great local menus, especially right now in COVID because where they used to host dinners, you can go and pick it up in like one little package, right? So maybe there's a way for multiple businesses to come together with multiple food producers. And so it's like, I wanna make a salad and a tomato sauce and something else this week. And then you pick up a bag and everything is in there and it's got some kind of sexy branding on it because again, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm at heart a recreational provider. This is not my background. So if you asked me to design a logo to put on something, I would be at a loss. And probably there are others working within the agri sector that the same would hold true. But if we could build programs and support mechanisms that would allow them to come together and do that sort of little like 
buy your spaghetti sauce in a bag sort of, and that you could go home and make it with the instructions. And anyways, that's what we were kind of yakking about here. So just opportunities, how do we build that capacity locally to connect those people, help them market and brand it, package it properly and get it out the door. Almost like, um, you know, you're marketing, you're not marketing the products, you're marketing a diet or, you know, a whole- Or an experience almost, right? Like that whole experience about we went out, we got these things and now we're going to come home and cook together and eat together and mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, when and, I was just, and I was just going to say, if this pandemic hasn't taught us that, then it hasn't taught us anything. And I don't think, I, I don't think that some people will go back to another way. I think they, that they will continue to do what they're doing because they value that. I put in the chat line, um, Leeds Grumble experience the variety, or you could, you could use that like experience the abundance, experience the history. You know, we're, we're, we're set, we're, we are so lucky. We are so rich in so many things. So we really yeah. are fantastic. Yeah, we are. So we've even got the tagline. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Tanya, um, if you want to make a comment, I see you're unmuted. Go ahead. Um, I, I love Kim's idea. I just wanted to say one of the most difficult things um, with that um, is, is the delivery aspect because we find that, say, you know, over the, the spring, the summer, you know, yes, Wendy's business, you know, really took off um, even, even more than expected um, on the Wendy's country market side with people coming from Brockville and, you know, Ottawa, even, you know, a lot of areas, but in the winter, they don't want to make that drive. So it's, it's delivery because, you know, people still want to receive it, but they don't want to come out onto those rough winter roads in the rural area. Um, but that, that aspect of it has always been the most difficult for, you know, area producers. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Tanya, for raising that. There are some very significant logistical um, challenges around the geography that we have and sort of how businesses are dispersed. And uh, that's something that um, that people have been working to chip away at for some time. And I don't think we've really got a, um, a, a fail safe solution. Um, we are out of time. Thank you all. This has been great. Super nice to see you all um, in this isolated time.